What's your evening routine, including supplements from like, take, walk me through 5 PM until your, your lights out falling asleep, uh, in bed. Yeah. So I, uh, I generally go to sleep somewhere between 10 and 11 PM. Although lately I've been going to sleep much earlier, um, because I've been finishing my last meal sometime right around 6 37. First of all, um, my evening meals are more laden with carbohydrates than they are proteins. Typically not every day. There's times I'll have a steak for dinner or something like that, chicken soup or whatever it is, but it's very clear that fasting and low carbohydrate meals, I'm not saying diets overall, but meals that those lend themselves to more alertness and focus. And a lot of people say, well, how can that be? The brain uses glycogen, you need carbohydrate. Well, when you are, when you eat a meal that is slightly devoid or devoid of starches, it creates a sense of alertness because there's actually a, a, a mild adrenaline response. So what I do is I basically, I'm rewinding a little bit into the earlier part of the day, but I fast until about um, 11 o'clock. I usually get my exercise um, at some point before 11 o'clock or, or noon. I'm not super strict about that. Then my meal is generally something, some meat, a salad, um, something low carbohydrate. If I train really hard, I might have some rice or oatmeal or something like that and some fruit. And then in the afternoon, I have a snack, which is also pretty low carbohydrate because I want to have that alertness and I'm drinking caffeine. So I'm kind of humming around, um, doing my work and trying to get into that high focus state for dinner. I generally will eat pasta or something that includes more starches because starches are known to actually reduce cortisol levels in the body. This is what, why we eat comfort foods. Most comfort foods involve eating foods that are pretty carbohydrate laden because there's um, a pathway involving carbohydrates and the, the amino acid tryptophan that converts to serotonin and it essentially blocks the cortisol response. A lot of people that are on very low carbohydrate diets, I have no problem with that if people do ketogenic diets or low carb diets, but those people often have a hard time sleeping. Um, they have to rely on a lot of sleep supplements or medication. Uh, we'll talk about supplements in a minute because there are some excellent ones. So in the evening, I tend to eat pastas and rice and soups, and I still eat some protein, but I, um, from clean animal sources, cause that's what works for me. But, but I generally am shifting my whole system towards more quiescence. I might do a little bit of work in the evening. We are not big, um, screen people in the evening. I do read books. Um, generally we end up hanging out, just talking and, um, listening to music and things like that. I might do some writing on the computer, but I'm not a big screen time guy. And I, I should say, I love movies. It just so happens that um, uh, I ended up with somebody who doesn't have much interest in, in movies, but is a, is a really terrific musician. So sometimes she'll play music and I'll read or work. And that's kind of my evening um, most days, sometimes dinner with friends or if it will happen, of course. So right around, um, eight or 9 PM, I start bringing the lights down. In fact, I have a real sensitivity to the overhead lights cause I'm so used to this pattern. So I start dimming the lights in the evening overhead. And then for the transition to sleep, um, I do keep my phone out of the, the bedroom as much as possible. Sometimes I'll use it as an alarm, but I'll put it on airplane mode. If I'm feeling a little too alert, I remember two things. One, the biggest peak in alertness actually occurs about 90 minutes before your natural to sleep time. A lot of people don't know this. This beautiful work from uh, Chuck Zeisler's lab. He's an MD out of Harvard Medical School. And what he discovered in tracking people's um, wakefulness and activity patterns is that they're buzzing around all day doing things ideally. But then right before their natural pulse and melatonin takes off, they have this peak in activity. And this, I think, um, probably harkens back to some need to, uh, you know, tamp down all the, the safety uh, leaks that might be in one's environment um, and, you know, get everything prepped. Because when you're asleep, you're actually pretty vulnerable to predators and attack and things of that sort. That's the rationale. Nobody really knows. But you can essentially figure out your, ne your best to bedtime by when you have this big peak in activity and then it, it kind of subsides. So sometimes if I'm feeling a little too alert and wide awake, what I'll do is I'll just remember that that's going to pass naturally. And I, I'm not neurotic about it, but I have to say, I generally don't do too much, um, screen time viewing or arguing or parsing of hard, you know, ideas before sleep. I, I, tr I try and kind of shut that down and people vary, but some people are just really tend to be very forebrain oriented. As I call it, they're thinking and anticipating all the time. It's good to try and taper that off. One of the absolute most powerful tools that has come into my life in the last decade 
that my lab works on, and there are people in psychiatry at Stanford that are also working on, is a practice that I call non-sleep deep rest, which is NSDR. You can do NSDR first thing in the morning if you ever wake up and you did not get enough sleep. I often wake up and feel, I didn't get enough sleep. I'll do a 30 minute NSDR. And I come out of that feeling terrific as if I got a full night's sleep. And I do this almost every day at some point. I might do it in the afternoon. Or if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're having trouble falling back asleep, I highly recommend doing this because even if it doesn't put you back to sleep, it's better than being awake and ruminating. And you're teaching yourself to fall back asleep. You don't have to do it every day. You could do it maybe once or three times a week. And what you're doing is you're learning how when you wake up in the middle of the night, you go to the bathroom, you come back, you're like, oh, now my mind is racing. What do I do? Instead of getting on your phone, you can start to use some of the progressive relaxation that you learned from those scripts, or you can actually do those scripts. And so I tend to do those in the evening or when I wake up in the morning. And that greatly facilitates my uh, transition to sleep and, and just being a, a more rested person. Now, in terms of supplements, um, I'm a big believer that um, supplements are powerful and are a terrific, often a terrific replacement for prescription drugs. Not that there aren't terrific prescription drugs. I mean, many people benefit from prescription drugs. I take a few. Um, but I think that many people rely on things that are excessive and, and habit forming, expensive and unnecessary. But I will say, first off, behavioral tools should form the foundation of all yours sleep tools, your wakefulness tools, behaviors first, behaviors first, behaviors first, for one simple but important reason, which is that behaviors rewire your nervous system. They, so they engage what we call neuroplasticity, which is your nervous system's ability to change. You get better at falling asleep when you do NSDR or Reverie. You get better at waking up and feeling alert when you view bright light in the early part of the day. With supplements and, and things of that sort, your system can react in the moment, but it doesn't rewire. It doesn't get better such that if you don't take that thing, you're just where you were before. Now, that said, there are some supplements that have been tremendously helpful for me for sleep over the years. And I know now that there are, I, I, you know, uh, humility aside, just from having blabbed about these on various podcasts, including mine, I think there are probably hundreds of thousands of people taking these things. And I want to be very clear that I have no financial relationship to the, whether or not people take these things or not. We, my podcast is sponsored by a, a, by a supplement company, but I'm not even gonna mention it. I just think find the lowest cost, high quality source you can. Um, there are many. And so the three things that really can help with the depth and uh, transition to sleep are magnesium threonate, T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E, -E, magnesium threonate. An alternative, which is just as good, is magnesium bisglycinate. Um, B-I-S-G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E, bisglycinate, either one. And what you're looking for is to get somewhere between 100 and 200 milligrams of those. Sometimes you'll see on the bottle, it says 2000 milligrams. That's the elemental magnesium. You'll, it'll also see a smaller number, go with the smaller number. What does this do? Well, it makes people feel a little drowsy and it, it greatly increases the depth of their deep and, and the amount of deep sleep. If you're a sleep tracker type with whoops or auras, you'll see this. About 5% of people don't like magnesium threonate and bisglycinate because it gives them stomach upset. You'll know the first time, um, but most people do just fine. The other thing that is a really powerful um, supplement, which is wonderful, is apigenin, A-P-I-G-E-N-I-N. Apigenin is a derivative of chamomile. Both of these things, and I should say that 50 milligrams is the, the target there. And there's only one source that I know of. I have no relationship to them, but that's Swanson. And these things are available online. These are both pretty low cost. The three and eight can get expensive. Um, I take bisglycinate and apigenin. And you take them about 30 to 60 minutes before sleep. And most people report having incredibly improved sleep. Are they habit forming? Not that I am aware of. Should you check with your doctor? If yes, if you have, especially if you have a heart condition, taking magnesium because of the way neurons work, you it's an electrolyte and you might want to check for that purpose. But I think um, most physicians, I, I think, would put these well within the margins of safety, but check with yours. Now, there's a third supplement, which is theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E. -E. Theanine is an interesting one. Theanine, magnesium threonate, 
and apigenin all trigger the activation of a, of a neurohormone, uh, excuse me, a neurotransmitter in the brain called GABA, which um, tends to shut off our forebrain. GABA, incidentally, is also what goes up if you have one or two dr uh, alcoholic drinks. The problem is drinking alcohol before sleep really screws up your sleep. Even if you're not drunk, it really screws up your sleep. A lot of people ask about cannabis and THC. Uh, Matt Walker, the great Matt Walker, you know, from Berkeley, who's the preeminent sleep doctor, uh, uh, scientist rather, uh, will tell you that THC and um, uh, marijuana in various forms and alcohol are really disrupting people's sleep. But listen, people are going to do what they do. But these supplements trigger a healthy release of GABA, theanine, anywhere from 100 to 400 milligrams is a, a, a powerful third component of this threonate or bisglycinate apigenin stack. And theanine is interesting though. Your dreams will get very vivid. People who have night terrors or who have, um, uh, who sleepwalk should not take theanine. Theanine is actually showing up in a lot of energy drinks now. Companies are sneaking theanine into drinks during the day and even into coffee because it eliminates anxiety a little bit and it eliminates the jitters. You can drink twice as much caffeine. You could drink uh, four of the same energy drink that normally you could only have one of if they stack theanine in there. So you might also want to take a look. I'm not a big fan of energy drinks. I am drinking some yerba mate tea this morning, but um, that's all that's in it. Um, but theanine is a great addition to this evening um, uh, supplement stack. And I do that about 30 to 60 minutes before sleep. One last point about sleep. If, if you wake up in the middle of the night, turn on as many lights as you need in order to navigate around safely. But again, try and keep the lights low. And waking up once in the middle of the night to use the restroom is perfectly normal. A lot of people think, oh, I woke up, now my sleep is disrupted, my sleep tracking score, my recovery isn't good. Um, I'm a big fan of sleep trackers, but I don't use one. I go on subjective feelings of wakefulness during the day. Just remember insomnia, clinically defined, is whether or not you're falling asleep during the day because you're having trouble sleeping at night. A lot of people think they have insomnia when what they actually have is anxiety about waking up and they, they're just concerned that they've heard all the terrible things that happen if you don't get enough sleep. So I think that hits the, um, the major things. Obviously you don't wanna drink so many fluids before sleep that you're waking up all night to use the restroom. One of the nice things about a carbohydrate um, rich meal in the evening is carbohydrates actually hold water. Um, for every gram of carbohydrate, you're gonna hold some water. Anyone on a low carbohydrate diet will notice that they lose a lot of weight. They, they think they're leaner, they're actually excreting a lot of water. So that's key. And then the temperature thing is really big. We haven't talked about temperature, but second to light, temperature is the most powerful um, stimulus for wakefulness. Actually, when you wake up in the morning, it's because your body temperature is rising. And uh, we can do a little experiment right now. Um, so what time do you typically wake up in the morning? Uh, I wake up around five. So, so your what we would call temperature minimum is 3 a.m., meaning that your low point in body temperature across the 24-hour cycle is probably somewhere around 3 or 4 a.m. And then as it starts to rot, so a temperature minimum is not a specific temperature. It's a time in the 24-hour cycle. And it's about two hours to 90 minutes before your natural waking. I'm not talking about the waking that happens in the middle of the night and you go back to sleep. I'm talking about the, wake, the typical wake-up time where you would rise. Okay, so... For you, your temperature minimum is about 3 a.m. And then your body temperature is going to start increasing, increasing of that cortisol release. If you can get light exposure as that slope is um, uh, rising, as it's increasing, then you're going to uh, augment a, a faster increase, okay? If you were to view light or get up at 2 a.m., it would actually jet lag you. It would actually shift you in the opposite direction as if you were waking up in some other location in the world. So that temperature minimum is kind of a nice thing to keep in mind. We'll get back to it in a minute, but what happens is your body temperature is going to go up and then somewhere around three or four in the afternoon, maybe for you, cause you're a really early riser, maybe about two or three in the afternoon, it's going to hit a temperature peak. The temperature peak is interesting. The temperature peak, you would think, oh, that's my time of gr greatest wakefulness. It's actually when you're going to feel a little bit of a drop in energy in the afternoon. And then it starts dropping. You actually feel pretty good in the evening. And then temperature should continue dropping because in order to fall asleep and stay asleep, you need your body temperature to be about one to three degrees lower than it was in that in the afternoon. So one thing you can do is you can keep the temperature in your home a little bit lower at night and just stay under blankets. Um, I did a whole episode on this, but I, and I don't want to get too far into it, but 
Um, we actually dump heat mainly through the palms of our hands, the upper half of our face and the bottoms of our feet. There's a special portals between the blood and the skin there. A beautiful um, thing was discovered by my colleague, Craig Heller at Stanford. These are called glabrous skin. Um, there's uh, special for the aficionados, you have arteries, capillaries, and veins. And in these particular locations, it basically only goes to art from arteries to veins. You skip all the little estuaries that are the capillaries between them. And you're able to basically dump heat more easily. During the middle of the night, the best thing to do is to have warm blankets on top of you and be in a cold room. And then if you get too warm, you will just naturally in your sleep, you'll just extend a foot or a hand out. You've probably heard sleep with socks on, terrible idea. Um, I don't know why that caught on. That makes no sense whatsoever. You, you want to be able to dump heat in the middle of the night because if you get too hot, you'll wake up. Now, some people say, wait, I was in a classroom and when I was in college and it was always when it was warm in the afternoon, then it would get hot that I would fall asleep. Yeah, that's true too. It's, it has more to, to your digestive patterns than anything else. But um, sort of, I think it's called a postperennial dip, which is just nerdy speak for after lunch, you get sleepy. Uh, but if you can extend a hand out, that's great because if the room is too hot, what are you going to do? You're not going to put your hand into a bucket of ice next to your bed. I mean, most people don't have that device. Some people use these chili pads or eight sleep or these kinds of things. I, I um, actually don't have one personally. I tend to run kind of warm. Oh, so I, I try an, and get the temperature. Use, that, that, that's an interesting question. Like I use an eight sleep and it, it can adjust yeah. the temperature throughout the night. So how should I adjust that to optimize the quality of my sleep? Should I start from cold and like gradually go warm or should I just do cold all night? Yeah, great question. Um, I was sent one. I still need to set it up, but I don't have any relationship to them yet. I think they perhaps they were curious about forming one. But so I need to try it. Um, so you want it to be cool. Uh, so I would say moderate temperature at the beginning of the night um, for the first two or three hours of sleep. Then you want to keep it cold until about that three or four a.m. point, and then starting right around. 445, your body is naturally heating, but if you were to allow it to heat up, then I think you would wake up more quickly. Um, it, I didn't so realize you, want you to had start that kind with of... like, yeah, you want to start with like an average temperature and then go colder and then go warmer. That's right. You want to mimic what would happen if you were sleeping outdoors, essentially. <laughs>